The topic right now is leveraging the human factor in the recovery. COVID 19's, the COVID 19 pandemic's power lies in its invisibility. We're all united by the crippling effects of an, of an enemy that we cannot see. Having seen the, having been the industry that was the first to be closed and likely to be the last to return, unlike other sectors, the mice industry's old way of doing business may never return and we need to start focusing on a new normal. The way that we have planned meetings and conventions, package incentive travel, showcase business and hosted overall events has changed forever. And this is not just a topic for the mice industry, it's a topic which uh, all sectors of industry also, uh, also um, facing, regardless of the country, the geographical aspects or the sector. Let me just put things into context with uh, and link to what we are doing in my organization, the Junior, Junior Chamber International, on that effect. We're an organization of enterprising young leaders aged 18 to 40, spread around 120 countries around the world, and we're partnered with uh, global organizations such as the United Nations, with a goal to empower young people uh, with development opportunities that enable them to create positive impact. And one of the things, one of the issues we've been addressing since the start of the year has been facing the economic aspects of a pandemic. So we've created a new global initiative, JCI Rise, to encourage projects from young people in their communities on how to, on three pillars. The first is um, preserving mental health amidst the uncertainty of a crisis. The second is sustaining and rebuilding economies and industry sectors in a sustainable manner so that the new no normal can also align with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And the third, which is totally in line with today's topic, is motivating the workforce. Trying to, uh, trying to notably for youth entrepreneurship, how can we use community needs analysis to promote uh, to show young people in the business today that being employed is not a fatality, but they can also create their own businesses in the mice industry and others to be able to uh, rebuild and relaunch and create a new mice industry on solid foundations for the future as well. So, um, and this is how we're trying to encourage, uh, we're trying to encourage business plan contests Creative, we're launching a new creative young entrepreneur competition, and uh, why not link it into a mice industry? I'll conclude this short uh, aside on JCI by saying that we're also delighted to be supporting the mice industry in Africa because we'll be hosting our 2021 World Congress, uh, which takes place next November in the city of Johannesburg, in the Santon Convention Center. We're hoping to get between 2,000 and 3,000 people, not for an online event, but for an in-person event at last, because as we've seen by today's challenges and the challenges we've all been facing in online events, we're never uh, safe from any technical glitches. So uh, we can't wait to actually see each other in person and bond our global network and to really have the heart and soul again. And I'm sure that for everybody in the industry, when we have real events again, we'll all have a huge smile on our faces. And all this to say that after hearing this keynote speakers we've had before, um, the mice industry, I'm proud to see that like other industries, but the mice industry in Africa and elsewhere has not wilted in the face of adversity, but on the contrary, you have all, been getting together, all the industry actors, the seven panelists we'll be hearing from right now, have come together to develop sustainable impact, to create economic growth, to create a more sustainable mice industry for the future, as uh, Jacinda's uh, amazing doc, uh, video on Kenya suggested, and to rebuild in a more sustainable manner. Currently, intracontinental travel is permitted in different continents. For example, in Europe, I'll be able to travel to Berlin in a couple of weeks. And I've been to Oslo in the last couple of, in the last two weeks ago as well. But across Africa, this is not possible because there's no Pan-African Schengen region and most of the borders remain closed, sadly. Post-COVID, the need for 
industry survival may drive collaboration amongst destinations on the continent and push stronger consolidation. Now, this panel will initiate dialogue on leveraging our greatest asset, the human capital, in order to spur a recovery of the meetings and events industry in Africa. The panelists who have been chosen by our organizers are professional and industry bodies who will discuss how we will build the necessary human resource capacity within the industry in order to optimize our individual destinations. The future of our industry was hanging in the balance before COVID-19 as if there was little effort to attract the best talent into the industry. Tourism is generally not a field of study that young learners aspire to pursue in comparison to vocational vocational jobs like medicine, engineering, law, or aviation. As we look to recover, our human development plan should be at the course of, core of our efforts because it will be all, all in vain if we do not equip the right people with the right knowledge and skills to, for tomorrow. I'll conclude by saying that the tourism industry and the MICE industry especially must all consolidate to show that we are, that the African continent and the countries in Africa are way more than just the sum of their parts and that Africa can really unite as a whole to impact as one for the future. So without further ado, I'm going to start by giving the floor to each of our distinguished panelists to be able to introduce themselves uh, and their organizations. Please stick to the two minute time zone, to the two minute time, two minute time limit that we have because uh, as you can see, there are lots of panelists and each one has to speak in a limited amount of time. So we're going to be uh, organizing the session as like a town hall event where everybody gets to speak with questions and answers. So bef without further ado, I'd like to uh, hand over to our first speaker to quickly introduce herself. Christy Sanders is the is representing the meetings industry and meetings professionals international. Christy, I leave the floor to you. Great, thank you so much, Kevin. It is a great pleasure to be with you today. Thank you so much for joining the My Summit. Um, meeting Professionals International is the largest association for meeting and event professionals in the world. We have more than 15,000 members uh, living in more than 70 different countries with chapters in more than 60 different locales. Um, each one of our chapters is operated as an individual unit, but together we're united underneath the MPI mission and vision. So our vision is that we are bringing together meeting and event professionals to change the world. We do that by activating our mission, which is to connect meeting and event professionals globally so that they can learn, innovate, advocate, and collaborate. And I'm very excited to be working with Molemwa, uh, who's one of the organizers of this conference to start the first clubs and chapters in Africa. Um, so I'll put in the chat, if you're interested uh, in learning more about that, how to get involved. So what I do for MPI is as the Senior Director of Community Engagement, I oversee our chapter networks to empower our chapter leaders to be able to enhance the professionalism of the industry globally, to uh, connect each other in meaningful ways and to empower their members through education. Thank you so much, Christy, and uh, great uh, that you are outlining values, mission and vision mission and vision, which are a huge component of what we're doing as an industry right now, especially, uh, especially the values aspect, which is hugely important right now. Our next speaker will be talking about incentive travel. So re representing the Society for Incentive Travel Excellence site, I'd like to hand the floor to Tess Pruce. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Um, let me first explain, uh, as you said, SITE uh, being the Society for Incentive Travel Excellence. Um, very important um, to understand that an incentive trip is not a leisure holiday. Um, incentive travel is one of the greatest motivational tools out there um, to reward employees for outstanding performance. And until COVID hit us, um, Incentive travel was actually the uh, fastest developing um, 
sector with, within the mice uh, sphere. Um, also interesting to note, um, having had a look at Dr. Manyara's great presentation earlier, um, the difference between business spend and uh, leisure spend. Um, the, also, we, being the eye in mice, um, incentive travel um, has the highest per capita spend across the sector. Um, at the moment, with uh, recent figures dating back to 2019, your average American incentive spends up to four and a half thousand dollars per person on an incentive trip. Um, just a bit more on, on who we are. Um, we're about, uh, we account for about 7% of all business activities globally. The incentive travel industry is worth around $75 billion. And these are 2018 figures. So 2019 probably was close on its heels. We're not even going to discuss 2020 at this stage. Um, but that's just to give you an overall idea of, of what this industry, this sector is worth. Globally, um, we are made up of about two and a half thousand members located in 90 different countries, um, across all um, suppliers between hotels, DMCs, uh, airlines, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we also have a magnificent young leaders program. Um, just a quick uh, point of interest: until a year ago, um, the chapter was site South Africa. Um, after some del deliberation with our board members, they've agreed to rebrand it as Site Africa to include all the other members and developing members, um, as uh, Dr. Manyara also mentioned earlier. I mean, Rwanda's just been such a success story, rising um, from five years ago, not even ranking, to being third on the on the ICA ranks today. And that's a, that's a magnificent story. And very exciting to see um, Kenya and Ethiopia and, and many other African countries following suit. So these opportunities are there and we've been engaging with industry across the continent to talk about developing intra-Africa mice travel and events. Um, exciting things happening there and it's, it's great to see uh, that under COVID um, circumstances, and you've touched on that, Kevin, how the industry has been joining together, collaborating to try and drive business forward, because I think we all understand what a powerful economic sector business events and travel is. And I'm going to leave it there. I'm sure my two minutes are up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tess. Um, yeah, uh, actually, what you touched on is very interesting. Like, incentive travel does have a future, as other sectors of industry are trying to motivate their workforce right now. This will be a great way to boost the incentive because uh, people will need to make sure that their employees are properly rewarded for their hard work as well. So, this will be a great niche to exploit and moving forward. Our next speaker is representing the International Congress and Convention Association and will be, will be joining to give some perspectives on regional conferences and conventions. So, please allow me to introduce from ICCA, Ismara Steinoffel. Thank you, Kevin, and a good morning to all the virtual participants. Um, I see some familiar names and I see some new names. Um, ICA often gets only called by the abbreviation, and then a lot of people still don't know exactly what ICA stands for. So ICA is the International Congress and Convention Association, um, a global industry association specifically for suppliers that work in the association space. So unlike TESS, for example, that represents sites that work with incentives, as an industry association, we work with associations. So also with regards to the stats that Dr. Manyara um, quoted earlier on, no incentive conferences is included um, in those stats, no government conferences, no um, corporate events, only associations. We are, as an association, 57 years old this year, so um, been around for, for over 50 years. We've got five regional offices globally. Our head office is in Amsterdam, and the Africa regional office where I am based was started in 2016, when the ICA board also realized that Africa has got a lot of potential to grow 
the association um, uh, business and well as business events and the mice industry as we often refer to it in, um, in Africa. Over 1,100 members globally and 44 members currently in Africa in nine countries. So mice in general is still fairly new in a lot of countries and we'll also cover some of that when we do the, the questions in a bit. Um, but really a lot of um, potential for cities and countries to grow their economy. And also, we always say business events is about the knowledge economy. It's about engineers talking about new stuff being developed in the engineering field. It's about cardiologists talking about new things in the, in the cardiology field. Um, so yeah, great to be here and great to engage and make sure that we grow the African continent for business events. Yes, thank you, Ismara. And uh, that's a great point you raised right at the end about uh, how business events are not just focusing on themselves, but they're actually a huge vector of economic growth because they, uh, they encourage emulsion of ideas and between and knowledge transfer as well. So uh, this is a great uh, this is a great point to make. Our next speaker will be um, will be talking about the associations movement and is representing the Southern African Communication Industries Association. So I'll leave the floor to Mr. Kevin Jones. Uh, Kevin, two Kevins on the same webinar. It's uh, it's uh, quite kind of different. So. Uh, Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name's Kevin Jones. I'm the Executive Director of SAPIA. A little bit about myself. I've been the Executive Director of this association for nearly 12 years. Uh, as is the case with Jeffers, I hold the CAE designation from the American Society of Association Executives. So I consider myself to be uh, a professional association executive as opposed to a specialist in events. Uh, I also have master's degree from Regents University London School of Psychology um, and, and I'm very engaged in the science behind events and association activities. Uh, SAPIA, the organization that I run, I'm just going to share my screen um, and, and I am going to find the screen that I am going to share. So uh, here we go. SAPIA is a SACWA recognized professional body. Uh, we, um, my golly, all sorts of funny things going on here. Um, so we're a SACWA recognized professional body. We have a number of special interest groups uh, that are specific to the events industry. So our event safety council uh, is actively involved in developing safety standards uh, that we apply in the events industry. Uh, we're the local affiliate of the event safety alliance, which is based in Philadelphia in the US. Uh, and we work with our co colleagues around the world to ensure event safety practices uh, and event safety philosophies are embedded in local events. Uh, the TPSA, the Technical Production and Services Association, is the association for technicians uh, working in the events industry, uh, audio, visual, rigging, lighting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then SEPA, the Council for Event Professionals Africa, originally established as a three-way partnership between EXA, SARKI, and the International Festival and Events Association. Uh, it was merged into SAKIA towards the end of last year. Uh, and across those three sectors, we have several professional designations that we award to individuals that allow us to recognize their skill, their knowledge, their ex expertise, and their, and their skill set in various aspects of the events industry. So, um, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm the person that kind of straddles the world of industry and academia uh, and drives this whole promotion of, uh, or promoting the adoption of professional standards, ethical business practices, uh, and academic excellence. Yeah, thank you very much, Kevin. And indeed, we'll be talking about uh, how you're, how you're uh, helping cross-industry uh, standardization using certifications later on. So our next speaker is joining us from Kenya and um, representing the associations movement well and the Association of Kenya Business Events, AKB, 
please welcome Nicanor Sabula. Um, thank you very much, Kevin. Good morning, good afternoon to all our uh, participants. Happy to be here. Um, I'm here wearing two hats. Uh, first, I'm uh, uh, the managing director of Africa's first uh, premier Africa management uh, company, Afamco, uh, but also uh, representing the Association of Kenya Business Events, ACBE, um, uh, that is a business event um, association here in Kenya. So also allow me to uh, share my screen uh, very quickly, just uh, as a way of introducing um, KBE, ACBE. So the Association of Kenya Business Events is one of uh, um, a, an industry association uh, established in the year uh, 2018. Uh, that brings together a number of a broad spectrum of uh, industry players. And here uh, we talk about hotels, we talk about venues, we talk about event management companies, uh, we talk about uh, destination management companies, uh, event suppliers, and transport um, um, uh, and logistics company. So our vision as um, AKBE ACB is to power Kenya's ascent to a world as business event and destination. And our mission is dual. One, uh, we want to improve the business events industry here in Kenya, but more importantly, and uh, which is very significant to economy here in Kenya, is to create jobs. Because we believe that um, the um, mice industry actually has a potential uh, to create jobs across the country. Uh, I will not really dwell on the aims. Uh, like any typical association, we are here to represent and be the um, single voice of the mice industry in Kenya. We want to be able to provide uh, research and relevant knowledge um, and data for the industry here. Uh, we are also looking at um, you know, uh, professionalizing the industry through initiating education and certification and accreditation programs, um, as well as to just be able to bring uh, the industry together. Um, uh, amongst our core values really, and I want to emphasize here, is the whole issue about sustainability and innovation, uh, because we believe that the mice industry has to be sustainable and responsive to people's needs, but also has to be innovation, innovative. And uh, um, this COVID-19 uh, season has actually clearly demonstrated the need uh, for innovation. So if you look at um, our membership, I think I did mention uh, the broad spectrum of the industry, so sort of like serving as an umbrella body uh, for the players in the mice industry, uh, but also we've got uh, three main membership categories. You know, one is a full members, and this membership uh, is open to um, uh, the corporate bodies that I, that I mentioned earlier on. Uh, we also have associate membership that uh, brings together other uh, stakeholders, you know, such as uh, tourism and travel schools, um, university faculties, but also other industry-related association and government entities. Um, we also do have aff affiliate members, and these affiliate members will either be individuals or businesses uh, that are actually interested in supporting ACBI and also uh, the industry so, um, I won't dwell on the eligibility for membership, but it's, it's open. Uh, we are open in terms of benefits, um, opportunities. We are looking at uh, uh, linkages with international um, agencies and staff. So, we are open. Uh, to membership, and if you are in operating uh, mice business in Kenya, our board is composed of quite some renowned names here in the in the mice industry, and you can see that uh, in terms of diversity. So I look forward to this conversation, uh, and welcome, you know, uh, to be able to speak more broadly about what the mice industry uh, is doing here in Kenya. So thank you very much, uh, Kevin. Thank you uh, so much, Nicanor, and uh, really happy to hear about your focus on creating jobs and economic growth as well. This should also be a huge focus. Uh, we're going to stay in the perspective of regional and global associations with uh, our next uh, speaker, who represents the African Society for Association Executives. I hand the floor to Mr. Jeffers Miruka. 
Thanks, Kevin, for the opportunity to, to be here and also for the opportunity to speak. My, I'm Jefferson Siroka. I also wear two hats. I represent first the African Society of Association Executives as the president, and also I'm the CEO of the African Association of Agricultural Economics. Uh, so I've been in the association industry in Africa for the last 12 years, and uh, I'm, I'm glad to see quite familiar faces here in this panel. Uh, the African Society of Association Executives is a professional community of uh, association executives in Africa and also the voice of the association profession in Africa. We do know that most developed economies have very well organized association movements and in Africa we've been around since 2015 and we started a business in 2016. So we're basically young but we have a membership of about 350 members who are our active members and also who are helping, who, who are who coming together for the good of the association industry in Africa. Our mission is to build and advance the importance and effectiveness of associations in Africa, while our vision is to, is shaping Africa's future through sustainable associations management. As we want to make sure that people who work in associations have the knowledge and the capacity to run associations. And as my friend Kivan said, he's a CAE. So people like him are actually very well qualified association executives. Our objectives are in education, uh, advocacy, uh, networking, collaboration and partnerships, and also in leadership. We invest a lot in that. We're doing a lot of training around Africa. Uh, we're doing a lot of uh, advocacy for our association movement in Africa. And also we look forward to continue serving the association profession or association industry in Africa. One thing I want to bring to attention uh, our, our viewers is that on 24th and 25th of this month, we're also organizing the uh, Virtual Africa Association Summit. We will probably use the similar platform. Uh, I will share the link on the chat. And right now we're welcoming registrations and we truly believe that we are going to have much more the men of you participate during that event. Thanks so much, Kevin. Thank you, and I uh, hope that uh, everybody can join this great uh, event moving forward. Now, uh, I'd like to introduce our final panelists for this first round. So, um, representing the academic world, because of course we need a strong academic grounding to all the work we're doing right now, I'd like to introduce a person who is a senior lecturer in the Department of Tourism and Event Management at Cape Peninsula University of Technology, Esti Venska. Thank you for the opportunity and welcome to all of the virtual attendees. Kevin, I couldn't have said it better. Um, we do need academics to form that grounding in order to support our industry, but that is the work that we are trying to do at the Cape Peninsula University of Technology. We are well positioned in Cape Town, um, being one of Africa's top tourist destination, winning many accolades in the event and tourism um, arena. This affords our students the opportunity to participate at a number of international conferences and get exposure in these skills and expertise, which is very important. Um, by 2030, they are suggesting that Africa's youth will make up 42% of the world's population. This is a very interesting fact if we think that we would like to have this youth go into various sectors, including the mice. And um, mice has catalyzed the growth um, of, of academic programs as the mice industry has grown. So there's become a bigger need for more accurate, more relevant, more responsive academic programs that meet the needs of industry. And that is uh, possibly the reason why I was asked to join. I work very closely with my industry counterparts, um, EXA, the Exhibitions Association of South Africa, and SAKI, the South African Association for the Conferencing Industry, trying to get or trying to close the gap between what academics teach and what industry wants. So it's very important that we close that gap to make sure that we've got graduates that can hit the ground running and really um, contribute to the economic rejuvenation and recovery of our sector. Thank you. Thank you very much, Esther. 
we'll be hearing more about how you're bridging the gap between academia and uh, the industry uh, later on. Thank you very much again. And um, well, now that all the attendees are familiar with our panelists and the, what they have to add to the table, we'll move on to the question and answer session. So I've prepared a whole uh, group of questions for each of our panelists. And I'd like to ask you all for the interest of time to try to keep your answers within the two minutes because uh, we do have a lot to talk about. So my first question will be uh, for Mr. Nikanor Sabula from the Association of Kenya Business Events. Now we've seen that uh, from uh, Dr. Maniara's presentation that Africa attracts less than 10% of the business tourism market, which is certainly not enough given the potential of the continent we've been talking about. What, in your opinion, are the opportunities that the impact of COVID-19 can present in the recovery and the rebuilding of the economy? Um, thank you very much, uh, Kevin. Uh, and indeed, I think those statistics uh, have always uh, worried me um, as an association uh, player in terms of uh, Africa has such a huge potential to be able to attract much, much more meetings uh, that it's currently doing. Uh, but uh, this can be explained in uh, three ways, in, in my opinion. Uh, number one, we still have a problem of connectivity, uh, intra-Africa travel. It is very difficult uh, to be able to travel within the continent. And this has been a problem that has afflicted Africa for a couple of years. Uh, you will be surprised to know that there has been attempts to try and break up these borders, but uh, we have not had sufficient political goodwill uh, to be able to open the, the African borders. Um, uh, some of you, or probably all of you, may be aware of the efforts by the Africa Union uh, through the single air transport, um, uh, through the creation of the single Africa air transport market, Saturn. Uh, that came into place a few years ago. And, and, and this, this, this particular um, uh, effort is to try and open up the African air spaces. And we are well aware about how nations have come to be protective of their, their air spaces. So that remains a fundamental problem. Um, and one of the ways that I'm thinking um, COVID could provide an opportunity is we're increasingly seeing the opportunity, opportunity around uh, hybrid meetings. So, so, so you've got virtual, you've got physical meetings. And I think this is going to help to break up you know, the, 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 the borders, even as the governments insist on having them closed. And so that's one opportunity I'm seeing that is going to create and improve you know, Africa participation and um, uh, improvement towards this. Um, other than that, I think, and Dr. Manyara didn't mention this, they are, they are what we call also um, uh, physical barriers. You know, it, it still remains uh, um, very, very difficult to access visa uh, and the visa entry requirements across the continent are still prohibitive, uh, not only just in terms of cost, but also um, it is still a shame that you, you need a visa to be able to visit many African countries. We've seen countries like uh, Rwanda, and we keep on talking about Rwanda um, uh, more, but Rwanda has been very progressive in this. They've, they've, they've decided that they are going to open up uh, their country and uh, no African requires a visa uh, to be able to get into Rwanda. So such things do facilitate um, uh, movement of people and therefore promote uh, the mice industry. Um, one of the things that I would also probably like to mention, and uh, um, I've been speaking to a couple of my colleagues, you know, in associations, but also in the mice industry here in Kenya and East Africa, is uh, we, we're still seeing a lot of borders closed. I think within East Africa, um, uh, we still have Uganda that has closed its borders, uh, and this ice industry. And one of the things um, they were telling me is that unless the, the three major regional economic blocks uh, be, uh, open up their borders, um, the mice industry in Africa is going to remain uh, affected. And this is um, South Africa. I think South Africa hasn't opened up their borders. And you know, South Africa is an economic hub in Africa. And so people coming into Africa for business 
have to go into South Africa. So if South Africa is closed, the rest of Africa, Southern Africa is closed. Uh, Kenya just recently opened up its borders and, and Kenya is a, a, is a regional economic block here in, in East Africa. So as long as Kenya's borders remained closed, there was no way business uh, meetings were going to happen. In West Africa, you're talking about Nigeria as a bigger economy there. Nigeria just opened their borders this week. So um, with the closure of these major economic hubs, um, we will have to wait a little bit, bit longer for the mice industry to begin to pick up. So one of the things that we must be able to do now is to open up our borders. A lot of uh, countries have been able to initiate protocols, uh, COVID-19 protocols. And so with these protocols, um, our appeal is that governments open up the borders so that we can then begin to see business meeting uh, happening. Uh, and of course, one of the things that, uh, unlike other parts of the world where um, the opening up process was such that you open up the domestic, then go regional, and then go continental before you go international, uh, we are seeing a bit of a challenge here uh, in Africa, and particularly in East Africa. Uh, a lot of domestic uh, leisure travel has resumed, and that is faring on pretty well, uh, particularly here in Kenya, but there's absolutely no business meeting happening. You know, and, and fundamentally is a whole question about always when you are facing economic challenge, one of the first uh, areas you want to manage is the meetings and the conferences. So you say, no, 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 hold on until the situation uh, stabilizes. So corporates are still uh, very um, uh, reluctant to start doing uh, uh, meetings, uh, business meetings. Uh, and so that will continue to affect the business um, uh, meetings industry until such a time that there is stability at, at the global level, and there's also that so that uh, domestic uh, business meetings can, can begin. So those are the, my quick uh, uh, observation in terms of probably what we need to, to be doing, um, and, and some of the lessons that I think COVID uh, 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 will, 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 will has, has brought uh, about that will have to impact the, the, the industry. So uh, Kevin, I'll leave it at that and probably also ask my colleagues to uh, make some additional comments they may have. Yes, thank you, Nicanor, for your very comprehensive reply. Uh, we're going to be staying on the topic of the macro view right now, and I've got a question for Jeffers from the African Society for Association Executives. We were talking about the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and so in aligning with the UN SDGs, what can African countries do as concrete actions towards developing recovery strategies that will help leverage their human resources to maximize their potential. And so we stop talking about potential, but actual real results instead in Africa. Thanks, Kevin, once again. You know, first we need to ask ourselves, uh, how many of us know about the SDGs? And we know there are 17, but again, how many know which specific SDGs uh, really uh, bother around the question you've asked me. So I will look at uh, the goal number eight, which talks about decent work and economic growth. And this, mean, this is basically to promote sustained, inclusive, sustainable economic growth, full of product, productive employment and decent work for all of us. And then I will go to the next uh, SDG number nine, industry innovation and infrastructure. And basically this is to build resilience infrastructure, promote inclusive and sustainable industrialization and foster innovation. And then I'll go to SDG number 10, which talks about reduced inequalities. We need to reduce inequalities within and among countries. So the question you've asked me, I could probably give a quick answer and say, one of the things that Africa must do is to stop brain drain. We know brain drain is basically the migration of skilled workers uh, from Africa. And we know that uh, the Africa Union estimates that about 70,000 uh, skilled Africans, uh, professionals, immigrate every year from Africa, especially to Western Europe and, and North America. And then we also know that the International Monetary Fund has forecasted that, uh, that, that was in 2016, it forecasted that Africa will lose between, from 7 million in 2013, 7 million professionals who migrated from Africa to developed world to 34 million by the year 2050. 
This basically is the immigration of well-skilled workers to these countries in search of greener pasture, in search of better life, in search of better pay, in search of all the things that a human being needs to live simple and happy and also to take care of their families. And then if you look at the World Bank in 2018, uh, they gave the, there's, a, there's what you call the Human Capital Index. The Human Capital Index in 2018 say that Africa is performing badly when it comes to brain drain. We realize that in Africa, it's only Mauritius, which is ranked number 52. There is no African country in the top 50. Mauritius ranks number 52 is the country which actually has the, the least brain drain from Africa to the developed countries, followed closely by Algeria, which is at position 93, uh, Kenya, which is at position 94, Tunisia, which is, which is at position 96, and the top five is capped by Morocco at position 98. You could, you could be surprised that uh, the top big three African countries, that's Egypt, South Africa, and Nigeria, are big, but Egypt is ranked number 104, uh, South Africa is number 126, and Nigeria is number 152. If you go to the U.S., the most well-educated professionals in the U.S. are actually from Nigeria. Most doctors, very good doctors, are from Nigeria. And also South Africa also plays into that, uh, into that list. So once we stop brain drain from Africa, and this is something which we all know, then we can be able to, re to retain our best brains and ensure that Africa can grow. Otherwise, if things continue as they are, then most likely we will continue doing badly. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you very much, Jeffers. Uh, that was really insightful. And uh, thanks for the link to the SDGs as well, which I, I really recommend for everybody in the business to uh, benchmark themselves on because they're a great uh, roadmap for future developments up until 2030. Um, now I'd like to move on to the specifics of the mice industry and I've got a question from for Christy from MPI. Uh, the mice industry is built on the conversations and the reliant is and relies on other industry sectors it seems that we've failed to maximize the potential of the African population to grow our events or attract uh, participation for our various regions and trade blocks within Africa, which goes on, which kind of links to a point that Nick and Noor was uh, pushing earlier. How do you think that from your perspective, we can cultivate from within and measure things accurately to increase uh, intra-African business? Yeah, so from what Nick Ordner was saying, it's not just the challenge of outside perception. There's also a lot of infrastructure challenges going from within. And I think that the answer to, to both of those, you know, right now we have a situation where a lot of the economy is, is dependent on this inbound business, right? The external perception is that Africa is a great incentives destination, take your high achievers on safari, or if there is an international Congress, they tend to gravitate towards South Africa. So I think that if we are to look at how to change things, we are at a fantastic point right now. The word crisis and opportunity has popped up a bunch of times. And if you actually look at the Chinese character for crisis, opportunity is embedded inside of it. So let's take this opportunity that those of you that are on this call we have so many different associations let's unite if we can unite the professionals within africa and unite all the different associations that are working together i know that site and mpi together with iaee have a global mice alliance but think about if all of the professionals that are on this call and are within your network could join associations, could join together to be able to speak about the importance of this industry, are able to raise the professionals of this industry, then we could address what Jeffers is talking about with the brain drain. If we are able to take this opportunity where yes, borders are closed, but we can educate each other about the power and the beauty and the opportunities and the diversity and the richness of each of our regions, then when the borders reopen, we are 
more likely to travel to each other's nations to have our meetings within those. If we are able to forge internal relationships with like-minded individuals, we can start to create those global, those universal talking points so that we can talk about the power of business travel, why it's important to focus locally, regionally, continentally. Um, if we can, I just think that right now, this industry anyway, not even just in Africa, right? What you're struggling with, what we heard, um, the good doctor talking about earlier, the potential. This is a fragmented industry. People tend to focus on where they are as individuals. They tend to focus on what kind of business they can bring in. Africa has amazing potential. Nellie Swart mentioned in the chat that nothing has changed in Africa for 20 years. So let's increase the professionalism in the industry, invest in yourselves, invest in your education, create your networks, meet like-minded individuals and start to leverage what that unified voice for Africa can be. And while your borders are closed, start to think about how do we do, not only just with associations, but how can we work with the African Tourism Bureau? How can we start to educate ourselves about what might exist outside of our borders? So those are the things that I think that we should focus on is that personal education, those professional networks, working with your local, your international associations to give you better opportunities, as well as helping the other associations work together. Um, and then just educating each other and speaking with one voice. Um, if you look at a sea of grass, grass is easy to bend over, it's easy to break, it doesn't have a lot of strength on its own. But if you weave it together in a basket, then the potential becomes visible. Um, and if you're talking about, you know, Jeffers had mentioned the, the SDGs, one thing that my community groups work with is they pick one or two SDGs that they want to focus on, and that gives them a purpose greater than themselves. Imagine what would happen if, you know, this is the first ever Africa Meetings Industry Day. What would happen if next year, instead of one event, you have 20? What happens if Africa shows up for Global Meetings Industry Day in April, where it's not just one organizer on the virtual stream, but you have an entire thing happening all over the continent. Once you start to show up and be more visible and start to have those stories and be able to share those stories, that's when I think people will start to see Africa not as a monolith, but as the amazing powers and professionals, and then you can start to keep your talent within your borders. So I know I jumped around to a lot of different things, but I hope that gives you at least some usable ideas or things to think about. Yeah, thank you uh, so much, Christy. That was um, that's really great and detailed reply. I think there was some excellent feedback on the chat about your intervention. And actually, my question, next question is for Tess. Um, and speaking about attracting people to Africa, uh, we've been talking a, a lot about destination marketing companies and why do we depend more on these companies to bring business to our continent and how does this, uh, in your view, how does this link to actual destination management? Maybe we can clarify to the audience what the distinction is. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Kevin. Um, it's a very important distinction um, for those who are, are not familiar with the terms DMO or DMC. Um, your DMO really is your destination marketing organization. And now we're talking about the likes of the Kenya Convention Bureau, Rwanda, Cape Town Convention Bureau, South Africa's National Convention Bureau, your tourism authorities. So those are the, call it government bodies that market your country, your destination. Your DMC, that is effectively a company like I have Crystal Events Africa. We are a destination management company. So the difference is your, um, your government body markets the, the destination. Your destination management company brings your, um, your incentive, your inbound incentives to the destination. And what is very important as far as a destination management company goes is exactly what the words say you need to know your destination so your client relies on you to come up with the best program the best um, 
opportunities, um, you know, understanding your client as well. What is your client's objectives? It's, it's very important for a DMC to understand what your client wants to get out of the program. I mean, this is a, a separate workshop all on its own, just on the topic. Um, but from a destination management company um, point of view, it's, it's basically our job to, to manage the destination to the client's um, absolute requirements. How do we tie together with the uh, marketing organizations? Um, our, many of our marketing organizations in Africa are relatively new and congratulations to Jacinta and, and her team. Um, I mean, the Kenya Convention Bureau is hardly a year old and they're already doing a fantastic job. But it's very important for DMCs and, and PCOs to understand how important that relationship between themselves and the, the DMO is, um, or your Convention Bureau. The Convention Bureau or destination marketing organization um, can help facilitate um, site inspections, subvention funds, um, really helping you market your own destination. And it's also very important for the destination management company and PCOs to understand that they cannot rely entirely on the destination marketing company to sell the destination. That is why we have trade shows like IMIX, like DIBTM and so forth, um, where we work hand in hand with our convention bureaus and DMOs to sell our destination. And it always has to be a joint, um, a joint effort. Um, I hope that helps answer the question, Kevin, back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Tess. That was incredibly clear and uh, I think it does answer the question very well. Thank you again. So my next question is for Ismara, um, who will give some perspectives on regional conferences and, conven and conventions. So South Africa has positioned itself as an industry leader in both leisure and business tourism. The existence of defined learning paths and industry associations undoubtedly grants them that added advantage. What lessons do you think the rest of the continent can draw in the recovery from what South Africa has been doing? Kevin, the key word here, and it's probably one of the words in my job that I mention the most, is convention bureaus. The reason why South Africa is, and Christy also mentioned companies tend to bring their events to South Africa, is we've got active convention bureaus that offer the services that are globally expected of a bureau. Um, the Cape Town Convention Bureau is the oldest convention bureau on the continent. It's about 18, 20 years old. Um, I know we've got Rick attending as well that set up the bureau. And we've got Adrian that's currently with the bureau. So in South Africa, there's a South African National Convention Bureau, as well as provincial and city convention bureaus. And very often, because business events is still fairly new um, in, on the African continent compared to globally, a lot of countries think if they've got a tourism authority, they can just somehow add business events to that. So we're very active on promoting the continent as a leisure destination, but a convention bureau is very different. A convention bureau needs its own dedicated staff, its own um, budgets. You need to attend the industry business event trade shows, like IMEX that takes place in, in Frankfurt, for example, or um, IBTM World that takes place in Barcelona. And normally at these shows, South Africa's got the biggest African country stand. Um, Rwanda, as we know, and Rwanda is a big buzzword at the moment, um, and has been um, since they started their convention bureau, and hopefully we will hear from Kenya. Um, I know Jacinta and her team are also very active in starting to promote the destination. So it's key to have an active convention bureau, and there are some convention bureaus on the African continent that to be honest, is a convention bureau in name. They don't have a dedicated website. They don't have dedicated staff. They don't have a budget. They don't have a meeting planners guide. Um, so it is really to actively go and look for the incentive groups because especially international business can go anywhere in the world. They don't have to come to Africa. 
they can go to Australia, they can go to, um, to Asia. So it's as a destination to actively start to look for the, for the business. And then just one more point to touch on is, as a continent, we are very bad at keeping statistics on, and I'm not going to touch on the leisure side because that's not a space that I work in. But besides, and I know ICA does a report that's very specific for a specific market and often our stats are, um, are quoted. Um, but the, I know that um, Cape Town does uh, keep statistics on, on the economic impact um, as a business events destination. Um, the South African National Convention Bureau did a study between 2014 and 2016 um, on the economic contribution to the country. So once you know what the economic impact is, what type of accommodation does all these various business events um, uh, delegates use, then you've got the information to go to government and say, we need more funding for a convention bureau, or we need funding for, uh, um, for a, a subvention fund. And the last point is infrastructure. And I'm not just talking about international convention centers. You need the airlift, the visas, you need the hotels, you need the hotel venues with um, conference facilities. The suppliers, it's very different from organizing an event like a wedding compared to an association conference or to, um, to, to test this point of destination um, management companies. So really, again, something we can talk about for probably a few days, but um, I think why South Africa is doing currently better than um, some of the African countries, if we look at business events, is active convention bureaus, national convention bureaus, provincial convention bureaus, and, and city, city convention bureaus. And um, again, similar to Rwanda, very active convention bureau. Um, the team from, from Kenya, they started the bureau. So we're looking forward to seeing what Kenya is also going to do going forward. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Asmara, for your very comprehensive reply. And as uh, I, I was just thinking, listening to your intervention, that uh, actually today I was supposed to be in South Africa, in Johannesburg, doing the site inspection for our World Congress next year in Santon. But that didn't happen. But I really can't wait, especially from what you've told me. And it reflects the experience our organizers have had of working in Johannesburg with the, for building the event. The fact that there's comprehensive infrastructure and a good supply chain behind it has really helped with the organization of this uh, Congress which I and so I hope to be able to actually meet you all in person next year in South Africa and stop by Kenya on the way down so uh, yeah look forward to it um, we've got two more panelists who are going to speak but uh, before that I just wanted to pass a message to the audience we'll have a couple of short minutes after the next two panelists to answer questions from you. So if you want, if you have any questions for any of the panelists, please post them in the Q&A section. I see that there are already a couple of them there waiting for me to check out. And we'll, we'll also in the chat and our panelists will have a couple of minutes afterwards to answer them. Thank you. Now let's move on to Kevin. Um, who has been talking about uh, straddling between various associations and therefore creating industry certifications. Um, the industry certifications that have been set as proficiency standards uh, have sadly not yet been properly adapted by the continent. Now, how do you see um, this? How, how do you feel that this has affected Africa's global competitiveness? And how can we, what kind of solutions do we see to improve things concretely in the future. So Kevin, I think that there are a couple of issues here. And the first is to say that, you know, you, you don't just impose certifications on an industry sector and expect them to be adopted overnight. Uh, it's a process that takes an extended period of time. Uh, and, and one of the questions that an individual would ask, you know, when they do uh, when they earn a designation is does it make me more employable well you know if it's not something that employers are looking for then no it doesn't so actually what i want to do before i answer the question that you asked is incorporate some feedback for christy uh, that'll allow me to lead into a, a more in-depth understanding of, of what designations are all about so the question that christy asked was, uh, was why don't the associations in Africa collaborate more effectively with each other? 
And uh, I was hoping that Tess might have picked up on that question uh, because in South Africa, one of the things that we uh, introduced as a collective at the beginning of this lockdown period was an organization called the South African Events Council that includes representatives from all of the associations active in the events sector. So there are 13 different associations, uh, including ourselves, including SITE, including ICA, uh, that have come together within the framework of this events council so that we can cooperate with each other, so that we can avoid duplication of effort, uh, so that where it's necessary for us to do so, we can share resources. Um, and by collaborating with each other in this way, we've been able to do things like uh, engage in industry research programs or engage with government on behalf of organized industry. Um, and certainly we've been using this as an initiative uh, to engage very actively um, uh, with the Department of Arts and Culture, where we've had several meetings with them about the reopening of the uh, events industry. Uh, mass gatherings are, are governed in South Africa by uh, the South African Sports and Recreational Events Act, SASRIA, uh, which is operated under the auspices of the Department of Sports, Arts and Culture. Um, and by forming this collective, we've been able to engage with, with government uh, on a very professional level, you know, we don't just turn up and say, well, we're speaking on behalf of our little association. We turn up and we engage with them on behalf of 13 other associations actively working in organized industry. Uh, so certainly that the vision that, uh, that Christy articulated is one that is a reality in South Africa. Uh, we, we should probably expand it to include more associations. And I think that that's certainly part of our, our mission. Um, and there's no reason why it couldn't be expanded even further uh, to include more associations in Africa. So, uh, you know, I think that's very much part of our plan. Going on from there, I think that the issue with, with professional designations or certifications uh, is that they need to be embraced by industry as a whole. Um, and so the, the designations that we award have been were originally developed as a uh, a three-way partnership between EXA, SARKI, and IFIA. So EXA, the Exhibitions and Events Association, SARKI, the South African Association for the Conference Industry, and IFIA, uh, the International Festivals and Events Association. The three organisations came together uh, and um, and developed an organisation called SEPA. Uh, the Council of Event Professionals Africa, and that council was then reconstituted as a special interest group within SACIA because we are an established professional body and we are already recognized by uh, government and the, and the educational authorities. But, um, but I think that it all comes about as a result of this cooperation and collaboration, not just with local associations, but with international associations as well. Uh, so if I look at the, the international designations, uh, you know, the question that people would ask is, why do I, why should I go out and earn a professional designation? And the answer is, I'm afraid, and it links in with what Jeffers was talking about when he spoke about the brain drain, I would earn an international designation because it allows me to get a job outside of Africa. Well, <laughs> you know, it doesn't suit our interests or anybody else's interests to get into a situation where we encourage people to earn a, uh, an international designation just so that they can go and leave the country and work someplace else. So for us, it's been a priority to develop local designations that are registered with SACWA, that are listed on the National Qualifications Framework, that are recognized uh, throughout the SADC region. So there's a regional qualifications framework in terms of which all of these designations are listed. Uh, and, and the important thing is that they bring together, and I think this is a, a kind of an important analogy here, they bring together a commitment to standards, a commitment to training, and a commitment to industry certification, and more importantly, equally importantly perhaps, continuing professional development. It's not enough for somebody to go off to university or college and earn a basic qualification uh, in event management. There needs to be a commitment to lifelong learning throughout their career so that as they progress from one, one uh, role to the next, 
They have the opportunity to tap into learning, tap into training, tap into mentorship programs. Uh, and as they acquire knowledge from all of these different sources, also have the opportunity to acquire uh, or upgrade the level of professional designation that they have. Now, it's also important that we don't work in isolation. There's no point in, in you know, us having a, a professional designation registered and, and recognized throughout the static region, unless it, is, unless it is also recognized in other parts of the world. So when we develop designations, we need to align them with the same competencies that are applied when an individual applies for a CMP or an E-merit or whatever the other international designations are. Um, but it's about creating a framework in which local associations can cooperate and collaborate with each other, in which we can embrace standards and, and, um, and designations that are, are accepted and recognized in other parts of the world. Um, and when we can do that, when we can create a situation where people apply for a professional designation because it means something in their own country, then... <laughs> You know, people will dive into this. It makes them more employable. It gives them the opportunity to earn money. It gives them a structured career development path where they can progress from one step to the next to the next. But if it's only about, you know, earning a designation so that you can go off and work in Britain or America or, you know, it doesn't mean anything to employers, so they're not going to drive it. And I think that's the important thing for us is that we now have a local designation that's aligned with the same competencies as applied uh, to international designations, uh, but it has some substance. It's recognized formally by SACWA and it gives people the opportunity to, uh, to em embrace a commitment to, to uh, professional standards, ethical business practices, commitment to lifelong learning. Uh, it's a holistic approach to career development within the events industry. Okay, thank you very much, Kevin, for your very detailed reply. Uh, it's great to hear about uh, the whole certification side. And I think to wrap up the whole panel, we've been talking a lot about education and training and lifelong learning, especially in Kevin's answer. I'd like to hand the floor to Esty um, to talk about the academia perspective. And um, the question is, how has the African academic uh, side recognize the needs of the tourism sector and how are you respons responding in developing the relevant learning contents? So the basis for future employees in the tourism business and the MICE business to build a foundation to uh, be an active professional and to grow the MICE industry in Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think it is great that I had the opportunity to listen to all of the speakers before responding and well placed after Kevin Jones's talk because I think it ties in quite nicely. Um, firstly, I think all academics in Africa are, are very aware of the SDG of quality education. So we really try to make sure that we, we offer quality education. So I'm gonna answer the question by focusing on um, Firstly, collaboration that we cannot get away from. We need to collaborate as academia with industry in order to make sure that the skills and the standards are matched. So um, here, what Kevin has mentioned around the designations, it would be a futile exercise if academics um, do not align the content of their curriculum with the knowledge components related to what you would need to be able to do as an individual working in the my sector so that at least that individual has got or has banked the knowledge and then can go and gain the experience and the hours of work and progress through the nqf levels or the quality uh, the the qualifications network from an nqf4 up until they reach their doctorate and in, in such a way reach the designations and progress with the designation. So that's the first point um, around collaboration. When it comes to curriculum, um, I would like to tap into what Tess and Esmery and the rest of the panel have mentioned about our students and entrants that work in the sector really needs to know how the mice industry is working. Um, 
we've got to break it down and say meetings and conferences and have um, modules that's, that specialize in the skills for, for meetings and conferences, but in a similar way for incentive travel and the suppliers that work in incentive travel, how does that work? Where does a convention bureau fit in? And similarly for exhibitions and now towards recovery, I mean, exhibition spaces and social distancing has had such a big effect. So academics really need to get on board and realize for recovery, these are the new skills that we need to teach our students. Um, context is a, a very important component here. We need to do this for Africa, by Africa, to keep them in Africa. Um, and therefore, we really need to think about the African context and as, as academics collaborate again with industry, we need to write our own textbooks of how we do business in the my sector in Africa. And um, we cannot just decontextualize American textbooks, although we le learn a lot from them, but the African context is different and we do things different. I, by that, I'm not saying we compromise on our international standards. We should be able to host international conferences, but we should be proud of our African heritage and the way that we organize and the context in which we operate. So that's very important. And then um, my closing remark is around contribution. The education that and the knowledge and the skills that we teach us, our students should contribute to the recovery and the growth of Africa. We should keep our people here. We have clever and smart people that can make a difference. And we as an industry should make it enticing for our students and our young entrants to stay in Africa and make a difference here for Africa by Africa. Thank you so much. Thank you, Esty, for these motivating words. And uh, I, I love the focus on endogenous growth within Africa and the pride of uh, being for the continent. And this it's it's something which uh, which I believe is uh, is something which needs to be pushed through and ran through. We we see it at JCI level now. Our motto for Africa and the Middle East, and mainly for Africa, is to impact as one. So to speak with one single voice for the continent, and this is really for the future. So thank you for wrapping up this round of questions, SD, and thanks to all the panelists. Before we, we got a question from the audience, but before I got a message from Tess, who wants to bounce back on a few of the uh, points which were raised during the panel. So I'll leave the floor briefly to you, Tess, notably, I believe, on the issue of collaboration that Christy raised. Go ahead. Indeed. Thank you so much, Kevin. And um, I, I was uh, very happy to hear Kevin Jones picking up on the uh, collaboration with our associations in South Africa. Um, and it, it's been a long and a hard road, but, you know, we, we're getting small wins and those little baby steps are, you know, always a positive, stop, a positive forward. Um, and, and thanks for bringing that up, Kevin. I'd just like to take it a step further. Um, we as site uh, um, held a, a summit on the 11th of June where we collaborated with a number of African associations and very happy to have Jeffers on that team. Um, well, I think we had about nine countries, um, different uh, key stakeholders from convention bureaus, tourism authorities, uh, big one, aviation. I, aviation and, and transport across Africa is key. And I'm very grateful to Esty and her team for having helped us translate all of this into a, 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 a comprehensive but not too long white paper. And I'm very happy to share that with everybody um, if, if the organizers uh, would like me to. Um, now the question is, you know, talk shop is one thing. What what are we doing about it? So, very happy to say that we have a meeting coming up with our Ministry of Tourism this coming Friday, and the team that met on the 11th of June is reconvening on Monday the 14th to discuss the next step. And and key obviously is to to get our borders reopening, um, aligning those protocols. If we can get African countries to agree and align protocols, the whole process will be so much easier. And I think Nikonor touched earlier on the, the issue of political goodwill, um, which has not always been forthcoming. The um, Open African, uh, uh, SADMA, the Open Skies 
critical but happy to say that we have 32 countries who have now signed the agreement. So it's again a step in the right direction. And yeah, it, it's, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day and Africa wasn't conquered overnight. But uh, there's definitely, definitely positive things happening and mice development critical, but we need to get the infrastructure and the aviation and most of all the service delivery, which means skills development and education. Um, that is critical to make all of that work. Thank you, Kevin. Yes, thank you, Tess, for this uh, great point. Um, now, uh, we, received a, we did receive a question from the audience in the Q&A section from Jill, which is addressed to Christy. Um, so I'll just read this. Uh, over, over above, the, it's a question about confidence in traveling right now, which is a main, major issue. Lots of people still don't want to travel because they're afraid of safety issues and there are all sorts of different barriers to traveling, getting on a plane, going through the airport, etc. cetera. Um, now the question is, how, do we, how can we, as the mice industry, instill confidence in attendees, visitors, delegates, and participants to attend in-person events and business meetings in Africa, notably corporate uh, business travelers. I mean, this is actually a, an issue I've been facing getting people to Japan or to Johannesburg for our JCI global events as well. We've got an event on a cruise next year in the Baltic Sea, so we're hoping that will take place. So what, what's, your, what's your take on it? How can we uh, make people want to join these events in the future? Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you, Kevin. And I, I think that it really kind of, it points to that perceived risk, right? Especially when you're talking about corporate business. Corporate, uh, you can hear in the, in the background, my husband is now waking up. It's about six o'clock in the morning where I am. Uh, so corporate companies want to minimize the risk. So if you want to be able to make people feel confident and safe in terms of, of visiting, you have to be honest and upfront and transparent. One of the best press conferences I ever went to when I was covering the meetings industry years ago was held by Mexico, the Tourism Bureau. Uh, at the time, there was a lot of news reports in American newspapers every day about gang violence or this or that or things that made Americans very hesitant about bringing their business south of the border. And the, the spokesperson for Mexico stood up there and he said, look, I'm going to address the 800 pound gorilla in the room. Um, you all are worried about drug trade and gangsters and violence and murder and all of that. So let me show you a map. <laughs> like, here's where our conference centers are. It's a three-day drive to where this violence is. And, and just putting it in perspective really helped people understand that the risks that they had internalized from this narrative were not necessarily the reality of what they were going to experience, right? So... Kevin, if you're trying to get people on a cruise ship and all they're seeing is, you know, people were stuck on cruise ships for a month during coronavirus, it's a challenge, right? But if you can talk about the duty of care, if you can talk about the steps and, that are being taken to minimize the risk and how things are different now in this environment because of the new cleaning pr protocols, then it's a much different picture than just saying, oh, come on, it'll be fine. So I think that, you know, what I think Africa needs to do um, region by region, you know, there's going to be different perceptions, right? So if most of the events are coming to South Africa because you have a lot of collaboration and you've got a really great infrastructure and your communication is great and your tourism bureau is out there at all these events and people are familiar with it, you're not going to have as much legwork to do as Rwanda, where a lot of people outside of the continent might have different associations, um, you know, and, and not realize that it's ready to hold conferences. So, so I think that just being honest and transparent and addressing the concerns, you know, we have a face-to-face -face event happening in November, and we are going to be the first industry event uh, in the Americas to bring people back face-to-face. -face. And so there's a lot of perceived risk, and there's a lot of nervousness around that. Um, but as Meeting Professionals International, we have an obligation to help the industry get back on its feet and to show people that, you know, whether or not there's a vaccine, there is a way to safely bring people together so that we can create that path through the woods that other people can follow. Um, so we have, you know, on a very micro level, some of the same challenges, but it all comes down to, trans to, to communication, to transparency, and to 
to tell that story and take control of that narrative. So that's what I would recommend. Thank you so much, uh, Christy, uh, for this uh, this great reply. And uh, yes, uh, we we are going to try to uh, raise confidence in getting people on the cruise ship, but also. Uh, for South Africa in particular, there's still this perception that it's a dangerous destination and all that. And as you were saying, you know, we need to, uh, we need to make people understand that the risks, as long as they pay routine precautions, it's fine. There are similar risks in Brussels or in Paris or in elsewhere. But uh, yeah, so these are, these are things we really need to, it's all about being honest and upright and upfront about what the perceived risks are and what the reality. And this, I think this links into what destination managers can provide as well in terms of the knowledge they're providing. I think that this was the only, I hope Jill, that this answered your question. This is the only question we've actually received on the chat. So I believe we're in a position to just wrap things up right now. Um, there have been lots of positive comments about the quality of speakers, lots of uh, links being shared, lots of extra insights. So I'd recommend you to uh, be able to, uh, I'd, I'd recommend you to uh, just read up all the links and uh, check it all out because this is a whole wealth of resources. And I would like to conclude by, first of all, by thanking all the seven panelists for your time and energy in distilling all this expertise and information. And I'm really proud, I've been really proud to moderate this event, just, um, not just uh, to be able to support the mice industry, but to see that everybody in the industry is being very bullish about it. Everybody is thinking about being resilient, transforming the challenges, not just wilting in the face of adversity, but maintaining direction and adjusting the direction like true leaders must do and uh, transforming these challenges into opportunities to rebuild and in reinvest and evolve for the future. And this is what, uh, and uh, this is what all industry leaders and all captains of industry and in all sectors should take inspiration from in the future as well, as we rebuild, uh, as we aggregate and help boost how MIC can help boost the global tourism sector as a whole, and also help become a prime actor in the global economy. As I said before, it's uh, time for us to and especially for me as an external viewer coming from Europe in Monaco, uh, which is also prime tourism des and convention destination, but in a different, uh, in a different situation. But um, it's time to, uh, I'm personally tired of hearing about the potential of Africa as a continent, but to talk about what actu actually Africa has achieved. And I look forward to having a, this conversation in five or 10 years, what Africa has been able to achieve, how Africa is becom becoming a pioneer in the mice industry in terms of innovation through constant education and ongoing learning and skills development through uh, harmonized industry standards and certifications through clear transparent destination management and through true added value and um, and impact on the industry and to economic growth in line with the UN sustainable development goals so in my role as JCISG I really hope to be able to boost the image of Africa as you all join together and be more than the sum of your parts and impact as one. So again, I'd like to thank you all. I'd like to thank the hosts uh, for inviting me. And uh, this is only the start of a fantastic discussion. I hope that it'll be the opportunity for everybody to keep exchanging between the audience and the panelists and for us to keep moving forward.